Well, good morning, my friends. I have um, one goal, one goal of my time with you this morning um, for my keynote, and that is this. I, I just want to encourage you. We are at a stage in the school year where we're um, sort of holding on for spring break, then we get a week off, we take a deep breath, and then we um, finish well. So I think a, a word of encouragement would be, um, is in order for, for everyone. I, I was in, I'm from Texas, and uh, uh, same thing, a uh, word of encouragement. I'm going to start this process of encouraging you by sharing with you a story. Something happened to me on Monday, August 20th, 2008. Uh, this was an event that was so significant, it, it literally changed the course of my career. That day, Monday, August 20th, 2008, that was my first day ever in my life, ever, as a real, live, substitute teacher. <laughs> now, since I'm a licensed psychologist, I know the best way to heal from a traumatic event like that is to talk about it. There's so much I could tell you about what a train wreck that day was, but I'll just give you some of the lowlights. I remember I was on my campus at 7 a.m. that morning, and I was so excited because I was going to change kids' lives. Man, I could feel it in my bones, right? And I knew this campus. I, they knew me. It, it was actually it was, it was a Title I elementary school campus in Bryan, Texas. It's where my kids went to elementary school. I knew the faculty. I had done professional development for them. They knew me. I knew them. So I'm walking up to the campus first uh, that, early that morning, and the receptionist sees me walk in, and I knew her, and I said, good morning. She said, good morning. I didn't know we have professional development today. And I'm handing her my ID so she can swipe it and give me a name badge. And I said, no, ma'am, we don't. I'm actually here to substitute teach. And she said, really? And I said, oh, yes, ma'am, really? And she said, well, uh, whose class are you going to be in today? And I forgot the teacher's name was Ms. Smith or something. I said, I'm going to be in Ms. Smith's class, third grade. Well, as she's handing me my name badge and my ID, she says, <laughs> Good luck with that. I said, oh my gosh, the haters are going to hate, but I'm not going to buy into the negativity. I'm here to make a difference. Get to my classroom at 745. The kids showed up. Oh, it was chaos. Everything I knew went out the window. Um, so this was their first Monday back at class. They were there Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They had the weekend off, and this was their first Monday back for the school year, right? And what I didn't know is that for whatever reason, the, the teacher had come in the weekend before and rearranged all, rearranged all the desks, right? So the kids came in, they were confused, and they were screaming. One kid literally got up and started jumping across tables, like literally was jumping across tables. And I freaked out. You know, I didn't know what to do. And I don't know if you've ever jumped into a cold swimming pool, and you're like, ah, right? You just can't breathe. I had that moment, sort of the deer in the headlights. And I'm, I'm panicking. So what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And so I'm thinking, well, being the first light bulb is, well, you're a school psychologist, behavior intervention, right? That's what you do. You need a behavior intervention for these kids, right? So I'm thinking, what do I do? And then I said, oh, I got it. I got it. Everybody knows if you've got a room of rowdy inner city third grade kids, all you have to do to put the fear of God in them, oh, son, you just write their name on the board, right? <laughs> so that was going to be my tier one research-based intervention. <laughs> I'm going to write kids' names on the board. And I said, oh, but you know what? I'm no idiot. I know that, that not everybody's going to respond to tier one. And I said, you know what, man? For those kids who don't have the fear of God put in them when I write the name on the board, do you know what tier two is going to be? Check mark, baby. Oh, yes. Check mark. So this kid got up and he threw a book across the room. I said, son, what are you doing? You just threw a book across the room. Yes, you, I saw you do it. You got up and you threw up. I was looking right at you. Yes, you did. Look, I'm not going to stand here and argue. You did too. I saw you do it, okay? I said, son, I'm done with you. That's it, man. I'm, what's your name? I'm going to put your name up here. What is your name? I said, all right. I said, hey, your little friend over there, what's his name? What is his name? I said, son, what's your name? I'm going to write your name up here. I'm not messing around. And it was stupid stuff like that all day long. It was a master's workshop in how not to lead a classroom. Twelve hours after I stepped foot in that classroom, a bell rang. <laughs> Finally time for lunch, man. I said, are you kidding me? How is it only 11.15? So I'm trying to make this big dramatic point to the kids about how bad their behavior was and how disappointed the teacher was going to be. And I said, you know, it's really sad. I said, we're about to go to lunch. I said, let me just count. So I turned around. I start counting names on the board. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, 28 of you are going to be stuck in here with me at recess. <laughs> this little girl in the back of the classroom, she raised her hand. She said, sir, 
there are only 22 kids in this classroom. I said, do you want a check mark, little girl? I'll give you one right now. I'm not messing around, right? So sure enough, man, the bell rings and kids go to lunch. I grab my bologna sandwich and my venti Starbucks and I'm, I'm a shell of a man like at 11, 15 a.m., you know. So I get down to the teacher's lounge and I sit down at the first table. There was no, there, no one in there. And so I sat down at the first table I could find. And, uh, and this teacher walked in, and I, she was actually my kid's uh, kindergarten teacher, like this brilliant woman, you know, a Jedi Knight teacher. And she walked in, and she stopped, and she, you know, she wasn't expecting to see me there. And it was this really weird moment of just me and her, you know. And she sees me sitting there at my table with my, my Starbucks and my bologna sandwich, right, and PTSD written across my forehead. <laughs> and she's just not sure what to do, you know. And so in this really sweet kindergarten teacher kind of way, she walks over, you know, and just very quietly, and she put her hand on the table, and she said, uh, Dr. Sines, is, is there anything I can do to help you? And I looked at her for a minute, and I said, yes, ma'am, actually there is. I said, listen, I know you, you sort of know me, but you don't know me that well, but I'm going to ask you a question, and I, I just need you to give me an honest answer. And she said, well, okay, I can do that. And I said, great. I said, ma'am, where on this campus do y'all stash the red wine? That's what she did. She laughed. You're so funny, Dr. Science. I said, sister, I'm not joking. I need a drink. Really, where do you keep it? She wouldn't give it up. Two seconds after I sat down with my bologna sandwich, another bell rang. It was time to go back to class, right? And I regressed, you know? And I'm just thinking, good Lord, I have not cried in a public school since 1976, man. But this sucks. I want to go home, you know? So um, I, get to, I make it through the afternoon, and, and finally the last bell rings, and all the kids are are leaving, and I'm done, man. I'm just like, get me out of here. And um, so sure enough, man, the last kid to leave the classroom was the one that had been riding me the hardest all day long, you know. Him and his little compadres in the corner, their goal was to break me down. His, his name was on the board. He had a check mark. He had a hashtag. He had an exclamation point. I think at one point I even gave him a pentagram. I was just so <laughs> done with this kid, right? It was like his name and then a blotted out profanity right next to it. And so he's taking his time, you know. So he gets to the door and then he stops and, uh, and right before he walks out, he turns and he looks at me and he said, uh, he said, hey, Dr. Signs, you're pretty cool, man. You're going to be my teacher again tomorrow? Dude, I looked that kid straight in the eye. I said, oh, dear God, I hope not. <laughs> right? So he left and then the teacher from across the hall came over. You know, she had been checking on me throughout the day to make sure I still had a pulse. So at the end of the day, she comes over, she said, Adam, how did it go? And I said, um, I said, you know what, I don't think it went that well. And she said, really? And I said, oh, yes, ma'am, really? She says, let me ask you some questions. She said, how many fights did you have to break up today? And I said, well, none. She said, all right. She said, uh, how many kids did you have to chase across our railroad tracks over there today? And I said, well, none. And she said, you had a great day. What are you talking about, <laughs> right? So you know that saying that, that a picture's worth a thousand words a couple days later, I think it was my daughter that texted me or emailed me this picture and I said, oh my gosh, this picture captures my first day as a substitute teacher. <laughs> right there. Yeah, I'm that guy right there. I'm that guy right there. And this is that third grade class, man, just <laughs> squatting the collective rear end of their bad behavior on my skills, and you can see who's coming out on top, and it ain't me, my friends. So that was it. That was my first day as a substitute teacher, 2008. Um, people that know me, and I'm from College Station, Texas, they say, Adam, I don't get it, man. You've got two doctorate degrees. You've got Ivy League training. Why are you substitute teaching, for crying out loud? And, and I'll tell you why I started substitute teaching. It really all started in 2001. That was my first year as a school psychologist, right out of graduate school. Um, and um, it started with what I called the look, uh, the look that I would get. Um, so part of what I did as a first-year school psychologist was this thing called consultation, right? So Adam, these are kids. We've tried everything. Nothing's worked. We need you to come in and observe and give us recommendations. Like, what do we need to be doing to be successful? So I would consult and do my thing. And I would observe kids in the classroom, on playgrounds. I would interview parents and just do my whole thing. And then after that, I would make recommendations. Like, oh, well, if we're going to be successful, this is what we need to do. Number one, number two, right? I'd make recommendations. Um, what would happen is that when I would consult and give recommendations, um, I, I would get this, the look, what I call the look, right? 
Um, and you didn't have to be Sigmund Freud to figure out what the look was saying, you know? And so I'd, I'd sit down with, with teachers and administrators and say, if we're going to be successful, this is what we need to do. And I'd read my recommendations. And they would look at me like I was an idiot, you know? And I thought, that's weird because in theory, this is what we're supposed to be doing, right? But I'm not getting buy-in. I'm clearly not getting buy-in on my, my recommendations. Like, what am I missing? And I thought, well, you know, I'm a first-year school psychologist. I'm, I'm actually from a, my, I worked in a hospital background. Maybe I just don't know what I'm doing. I don't know, right? Well, that goes on my whole first year. I'm giving recommendations, and I'm getting people look at me like I'm an idiot, you know? Into my second year, spring semester, I was working at the high school with this one teacher whom I will describe as, let's just say she was comfortable speaking her mind. I'll put it that way, right? So she's got this kid in her class, and I go, you know, we tried everything, nothing's worked, come do your recommendations, right? Your consultation thing, your, your consultation thing, right? So, okay. So I go and I observe, and we go back to a staffing, and, and we sit down at a table like this, and I hand out my report. Okay, if we're gonna be successful, go to the last page, recommendation number one, number two, number three, so I read through my, and I get the look, the, the whole predictable routine, right? Well, as I'm reading through my recommendations, I could feel this woman's eyes burning a hole in my forehead, right? Like she was just staring me down, right? In Spanish, we called it mal de ojo, you know, the, the stink eye, right? And so I'm like, this is weird, man. When, I'm, when I finish these recommendations, I'm out of here because I feel uncomfortable. So I finished my recommendations and everybody stood up, right? Because I was the only reason we were meeting and everybody was leaving, right? And so I thought, oh, okay, I want to get out. But everybody bottlenecked at the door and I got stuck in the back of the pack. So everybody's leaving and this woman just stayed seated at the table, right? And I could feel her eyes burning a hole on me, right? Well, right when I put my hand on the doorknob to walk out, um, I was just wanting to leave. And she said, Dr. Science, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, oh, great, here it comes, you know? And so I turned and I said, yes, ma'am, how can I help you? And she said, I just have one question for you. Have you ever taught, right? And I don't know how, but as soon as she said, I have one question for her, I knew exactly what she was gonna, I don't know how, but I knew she was gonna ask me that, so I had my answer ready. She said, have you ever taught before? And I said, yes, I taught graduate statistics at Texas A&M University. <laughs> oh, son, wrong answer, man, wrong answer. No, sir. She said, let me be more specific. Have you ever in your life taught K-12? And I said, no, ma'am, I haven't. Man, she collected her stuff, put it in her book bag. She got up and she said, ha, that's what I thought. Got up, turned around, walked out. And that was that. So my first thought was, huh, what an incredibly bitter little lady you are. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna suck to work with you. But I get to leave this campus, so whatever, right? Well, you know, in the, in the days that, that, that came after that, after I got over my wounded ego, I started thinking, you know what, Adam, not only is that a fair question, that's an essential question for a guy like you who's going around telling teachers how to do their job, you know? And I started wondering, like, what if I'm that guy, you know, the ivory tower academic with, with the, the PhD that knows everything in theory about what we need to be doing with kids, but has no clue what it's like to be in the classroom, right? Because my undergraduate degree was in English, and then I went straight into psychology. So I said, you know what, man, I'm too old to go back to school and change my major to be a teacher and, and figure that out. Um, so the closest I'm gonna get to having classroom experience is to substitute teach, right? And that's why I started substitute teaching in, in, in 2008. Still substitute teach now, I coach high school track and field uh, when I'm not being a psychologist and love it. The, the first light bulb though that went off for me after that very first day of substitute teaching, it was this. Hey Adam, guess what big guy? It doesn't matter how many degrees you have, it doesn't matter where you got them from, it doesn't matter what you think you know about education, unless you've actually taught in a classroom, unless you've actually done the work day in, day out, day in, day out, there is no way you will ever understand or appreciate how incredibly demanding that role is in a classroom and on a campus. It was a huge, huge insight for me. It reminded me of a t-shirt I saw one time that said, those who can, teach, and those who can't make laws for those who teach, right? <laughs> I was that guy. I was that guy. And so what happened was I was filled with a sense of admiration, you know, for, for men and women like you, perhaps, that are in the classroom doing an amazing job. And I'm talking about like from PPCD classrooms all the way up 12th grade and beyond, just overwhelmed. Like, are you kidding me? This thing is that difficult. And yet there are men and women that are doing just a phenomenal job. 
So I was overwhelmed with a sense of admiration. And then what happened was that feeling of admiration shifted to one of curiosity. And I got really curious and I thought, well, how do you get good at that, right? You know that thing called being a classroom teacher, working with kids? Number one, and number two, how do you get good at it and stay good at it when data show that about half the teachers working in schools now will be employed in another profession in five years or so? So I was really curious and I thought, I don't, I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that question. I, I'm, I'm not a classroom teacher. I, you know, I don't have a teaching certificate. I'm not an administrator. I've never been a principal. I don't know anything about curriculum instruction or pedagogy or instructional strategies. I don't know what a lesson plan, I don't know anything about that. So I felt stuck. I'm really curious, but I, um, I'm not qualified to answer the question. So after a few months of really, really thinking about it, I thought, well, hold on, Adam. You've got a PhD in psychology. You're, you're a licensed psychologist. Uh, you've got a doctorate of ministry and pastoral counseling, you're ordained clergy, that's your angle. Why don't you investigate the psychological variables that drive vocational satisfaction? And then why don't you investigate the spiritual or existential variables that drive vocational satisfaction? And then distill that to the world of an educator. And then I got really excited. I said, I'm actually qualified to answer that question. So I started doing research around 2008, 2009, 2010, looking at that. What are the psychological variables that drive satisfaction and sustainability professionally? And then what are the spiritual or existential variables that drive uh, uh, sustainability and excellence in our profession? And basically what I found is this, that no matter what I do, whether I'm a banker, plumber, lawyer, welder, tradesman, psychologist, educator, whatever I do, if I'm going to do it well, number one, and number two, do it sustainably so that I don't burn out, two things have to be true of me. Two things. Number one, I have to understand that what I'm doing, it's not just a job. A job is just a basic agreement to swap labor for a paycheck. I also have to understand that what I'm doing, it's not just a career. A career is just a job with advancement opportunities. But if I'm going to do what I do well and do it sustainably over time, there has to be some sense of calling for me in what I'm doing. And, and that is finding the, not the what, not the where, not the when, not, but, but why. Okay? And how I do that is whatever truth-finding rubric I use to navigate through life, whether it's rooted in a major world religion, philosophical belief system, rational empiricism, secular humanism, agnosticism, atheism, whatever rubric I use to find truth, I have entered into that rubric with these two powerful questions. Number one, who am I? And number two, why am I on this planet? And calling for those of us in education is that rubric answers back to us and says, this is who you are, and the reason you're on the planet is those kids in that building, right? They need you. You're going to shape the next generation. That's the essence of calling. Uh, this is how it plays out in the life of the average classroom teacher. Let me ask this. By any chance, are there any first-year teachers in the house? Raise your hand if you're a Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. Show them some love. Awesome. Welcome to the family. Suckers. You know how I can tell a first-year teacher on the first day of school? Oh my gosh, it's so obvious. Her hair is perfect. Her makeup is perfect. Her outfit is cute and she's teaching kids like her hair's on fire, right? And if you're lucky, first year teacher, if you are lucky, you will make it to October 1 and you'll look at your watch and you'll say, oh good Lord, is it Thanksgiving yet, right? Thanksgiving rolls around, you sit down at the Thanksgiving table and you say these words, I can't figure out why, I can't stop eating. Five days, seven pounds later, you go back to your campus and you say, oh, I got just enough juice in me to get me to winter break. By the time winter break rolls around, you get off work on Friday and you think back, you get home and you think back to Thanksgiving. And you say, oh, my gosh, I overate at Thanksgiving. I'm not going to overeat again. I'm going to drink. <laughs> First thing when you do is you walk in, you open a bottle of wine, you pour yourself a <laughs> Wait, did I say wine? Girlfriend, you are a first-year teacher with $60,000 worth of student loan debt. You can't afford a bottle of wine. You're going to sit down and twist the cap off a of 40 of Mickey's. That's what you're going to do. You're going to sit down with your 40 of Mickey's, brown paper bag, twist it around it, box of tissues, remote control, and two weeks of the Lifetime Network. January rolls around. You awaken out of a drunken stupor. You say, I got just enough juice in me to get me to winter break or spring break. Well, spring break rolls around. And um, you say, you know what? I'm too tired to eat. I'm too tired to drink. All I want to do is sleep. I know what I'll do. I'll kick off my spring break with a little 10-minute nap. You lay down for your 10-minute nap. The next thing you know, your alarm clock is going off. You're late for work 10 days later, right? You slept through spring break. You wake up in a panic, and you say, hair, makeup, pfft, ain't nobody got time for that. So you go to your campus. I got just enough juice in me to get me through that date with destiny in April. My kids have to take a test. 
Well, by the time May rolls around, you're in full-blown zombie mode. You're not even speaking in complete sentences. You're just, ah, right? Now you're showing up to work in curlers and a moo-moo for crying out loud, <laughs> right? How far you have fallen from grace. You got a little trickle of blood out of the corner of your mouth. What is that blood? It's that student. You tried everything, nothing worked. Pfft, I finally just ate him, man. I didn't know what else to do, right? Well, the only thing that's going to snap you out of zombie mode in May is you're going to walk into the teacher's lounge, right? And you're going to look in your mailbox. You're going to see a piece of paper. You're going to pull it out. And it's going to have your school corporation, your school district on top, you know, South Bend, whatever. And it's going to have your name on it. And you're going to read it. And then you're going to rub your eyes like that and say, oh, my gosh, can't believe it. Ha! They renewed my contract, right? I didn't get fired. So then you're all excited because you got a job, right? In year two, you show back up and you know your lesson plans and you know the kids and you know the, the parents and the building and your college, all that, right? And so you start finding your stride. Um, year four, you take on more responsibility. Well, right around year five, you have what I call the Dunkin' Donuts moment, right? So back in my day, there was this old Dunkin' Donuts commercial. And I don't know if y'all remember that, but this guy would wake up at some ungodly hour and what would he say? time to make the donuts, right? And it's just this idea like, oh, I'm not feeling it, man. I don't want to be here, right? And I'll tell you, down in Texas, when we have our Dunkin' Donuts moments in schools, invariably, it will happen between January 15th and February 15th. Invariably, right? What happens is the temperature plummets to 29 degrees Fahrenheit, and we freak out, right? So we see that magic 29, and we think, oh, there it is. And we start praying in Jesus' holy name for a snow day, right? Make it happen, right? And so you go home that afternoon, the first thing you do is turn on the Weather Channel, and you look at that banner of all the districts that are getting canceled, right? And, oh, make it out in Jesus' Like my mom's, aprenda la vela, light a candle, you do whatever you have to do, right? Make it happen, lucky seven. Well, you know, so the temperature's 29 degrees, and in Texas, like, if there's, like, a drip of ice on a stop sign, we shut the whole thing down. Like, that, no snow day. It's, remember, you know, we have to be safe, right? Well, there's no snow day, right? And so you wake up that morning, and you're not feeling it. It's time to make the donuts, and you get in your car, and you go to your campus, and you're sitting there, and you're locked in your car, and you say, oh, I didn't sleep well last night, but that kid that's running circles around me, he slept like a baby, right? And he's going to be loaded for bear. And you're, ah, stupid district, ah, stupid parents, stupid kids, stupid curricula. I, I hate it, right? And then you ask this ever important question. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? They don't pay me enough for this. All the abuse I have to put up with. I get blamed for things that aren't my fault. I don't get credit for things I do well, right? And that's the central question. And you stop and say, you know what? That's it. I'm done. I'm going to get my real estate license and they can take this job, right? And so... But in that moment, in that Dunkin' Donuts moment, I stop and I say, you know what? I could bail ship, I could go climb a corporate ladder, I could go sell real estate. But I remember when I went into my truth-finding rubric with those two questions, one of the answers involved those kids, right? And those kids are not gonna be out in the houses that I'm gonna show, they're not gonna be climbing that ladder, the corporate ladder, they're gonna be in that building, right? So that's it, number one, if I'm gonna do what I do well and do it sustainably, it can't just be a job, it can't just be a career. There has to be some sense of calling for me, that, that finding the right why. Is my why compelling enough to sustain me through the ups and downs in any relationship? So that's the first thing. Here's the second thing. I don't find satisfaction in my calling. I don't find satisfaction in my calling. Instead, I find satisfaction in the totality of my life and I take satisfaction to my calling. Okay. So let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, this idea that I'm finding satisfaction in my life and taking it to my calling. Another way to say that is that I'm practicing self-care. So we can think of our life as a wheel. Each spoke represents a major area. If I'm taking care of myself, which means that I'm being a good steward or a good manager of my emotions, my finances, my body, my occupation, all those areas, this is what my wheel looks like. That's me living my A game, right? That's peak performance for me. Um, and, it, and it's awesome. When I'm not taking care of myself, though, my wheel doesn't even look like a wheel anymore. It looks like that red thing. And that's like my, my C minus game. And what I know as a psychologist is that those two wheels represent two completely different people. If I'm the red wheel, my cup is always half empty. And if I'm the green wheel, my cup is always going to be half full, right? So for the red wheel people in life that live there, I mean, we all get there. But for people that live there, like that's their climate, that's their normal. I call those the Eeyores of life, right? From Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore, right? That's the person, if you give them a $100 bill, they're going to say, great, now I have to go to the bank to get change, right? Probably going to have a flat tire on the way to the bank and 
when I get out to change my flat, I'm probably going to get hit by a truck and I'm going to get killed. So whatever. Thanks for this $100 death certificate you just gave me. <laughs> right? Life suckers, man. Nobody wants to. Raise your hand if you know a life sucker. Does anybody know a life sucker? Yeah, you do. Raise your hand if they're sitting right next to you. Anybody? <laughs> we got hands there and there and there. Man, nobody wants to be around a life sucker for crying out loud, right? But if I'm the green wheel, my cup is half full. I'm a life giver. And I show up to my campus, into my classroom, working with my students, and I say, what's the problem and how can I be part of the solution? Instead of what's the problem and how can I put it on steroids by attacking, blaming, criticizing, condemning, and all that other, you know, nastiness defense mechanisms that we use in our dark moments, right? So uh, the green wheel is cup half full, the, the red wheel is cup half empty. And, and how we approach relationships, this drives how we approach relationships. If I'm cup, the cup half empty, my whole approach to relationships is I'm not doing well, and it's your job to fill me up. It's your job to complete me, to validate me, to make me whole, right? And that's true in my peer relationships, in my romantic relationships, in my friendships, and in my relationship with my calling. So if I'm a life sucker, hey, calling, I'm not doing well. So calling, your job is to fill me up, validate me, make me whole, but, you know, remind me that, that what I do matters, right? Um, and it's never going to be enough. Versus I'm a life giver and I say, no, I'm here to love, I'm here to serve. You know, what, what do you need and how can I help you? Now, being a life giver will deplete me, absolutely. But it's just like my iPhone. You know, when it gets to the red uh, 20%, that means you better plug me in real quick or I'm not going to be of any use to anyone. And so what makes excellence sustainable is learning to recognize um, we have an internal check engine light that says self-care, right? And so it's, it's really about being filled up and then being poured out and being filled up and then being poured out. That model is sustainable. So my wife and I um, both work for, for the school district in, in Bryan. Uh, Texas, Bryan College Station, for, we've been special ed people for 20 years, and we've learned, we learned early on that the, the, the school year gives us a rhythm to be filled up and poured out, and, filled, and you have to honor that rhythm to be sustainable, right? So that's it. Um, if I'm going to do what I do well um, and do it sustainably, those two things have to be true of me. Number one, it can't just be a job, can't just be a career. There has to be some sense of calling. I have to be there for the right why. And then number two, I'm not looking to that why to validate me or to make me whole or complete. I'm already valid. I'm already whole. I'm already complete. I'm there to love, serve, and be poured out, right? And out of that research, I ended up writing my book, The Power of a Teacher. If, if I'm in education, how do I do those things? And that was, I, I, this book was released in 2012. And then over the, the, the more I worked with, with uh, teachers and more I worked in my clinic and college station, the more I realized how deeply, deeply relational effective learning is. Um, and so I wrote a book called Relationships That Work. What are four essential, what I call relational readiness skills that have to be in place for any relationship to have a hope of, of surviving and thriving? And then most recently, uh, last month, I re released the, the, my latest book called The EQ Intervention. Just thrilled, thrilled about the work that, that's going on in public schools now in social emotional learning. This is, the, you know, where carrots and sticks are failing us, social and emotional learning is, is it's the new tool. And I love the work that we're doing. So I told you that my primary goal was to encourage you. And um, I could talk through data and research and all of that. And I, I don't think that would encourage you. Um, but what I'm going to do to encourage you is I'm going to share a couple of case studies in the time that I have left. And I think these case studies will do more to encourage you than me talking through data and research. Um, so these are a couple of kids I'm going to talk about. The boy on the left is a, a sixth grader. His name is Lou. The girl on the right is a fourth grader, and her name is Maya. These are real kids. I've got parental consent for both uh, kids. So uh, real deal here. As I talk through these two kids, there are two uh, questions that I'm going to come back to. Number one is, do you care about me? And number two is, can I make my own rules? And there is so much psychology packed into those two questions. But let me break it down this way and say it like this. Anytime you have a leader follower dynamic in any capacity, whether it is a teacher with students in a classroom, an administrator with teachers on a campus, a coach with athletes, a boss with employees, a parent with children at home, for any time there's a designated leader and a designated follower, for the follower, following is about surrendering control, right? So if you're going to lead me, leader, I have to surrender control to you to let you lead. And that can be a very scary prospect, especially for some of the kids that we work with. If you come from a traumatic background, the last thing you want to do is surrender control, 
right? So listen, leader, before I give you this precious jewel called control of my life, I need to know two very important things about you. Number one, do you care about me? Why would I ever surrender control to anybody that I didn't believe cared about me? You've, I've got to know that you have my best interest at heart, number one. And number two, once you start leading me, can you get me where you say you want to take me? Um, are you going to make the rules or am I going to make the rules, right? So are you competent enough and strong enough to lead me or can I rise up and throw you off your game? So the first question is about love and the second question is about respect. And where you have no love and where you have no respect, you'll have no surrender of control. It's, it's just that simple, right? So I'm going to be coming back to these two questions as I talk through my two case studies. Um, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes for a minute. Close your eyes for a minute. I want you to think about the kid that's wearing you out right now. Right? The kid that makes you sit out in the parking lot wondering whether you really want to walk in the building. Right? And, and yes, your heart breaks for this kid. And at some level, you just feel really angry and bothered, right? Because this kid is sort of a thorn in the flesh. And if you're really honest, you, you think, man, if that kid, like if somebody could just take him off my plate, my life would be so much easier. You may have 29 candidates that are all qualified. Just pick one that you think, man, if I could not work with that one student, that'd be a lot better for me. Okay, put a sticky note on that kid, that young man or that young woman. We're going to come back to him or her. Let me tell you about this first kid. Uh, Latino male, he comes from a low socioeconomic home, uh, single, uninvolved parent, he's truant, he's got problems with the law, he's, he's got mental illness, and he's using street drugs to self-medicate. Um, demographically speaking, any one of those variables is a strike when you talk about educational outcomes. But when you load all of that into one kid, the likelihood that it, he will ever be successful, statistically speaking, it drops dramatically. Um, and, and again, it, it's bad news for us in schools because um, the, the, the primary toolbox that we have uh, to work with a student like this to sort of bring out their best selves is rooted in behavioral psychology. It's carrots and sticks, right? Um, and so we talk about positive behavior support, we talk about social reinforcement, um, and then we talk about consequences like suspensions, expulsions. Well, the bad news is that none of our sticks are big enough or sweet enough or juicy enough to get this kid's attention. Um, none of the carrots work, and none of the sticks are big enough or, or threatening enough to, to scare him into compliance. So this basic toolbox we have that we've been given, handed down for the last 60 years, uh, it doesn't work that much, right? And, and when you use your tools and you try to, to reach the student, you're left with some very intense and uncomfortable feelings because he's not responding. You feel sad, you feel angry, you feel frustrated, you feel hopeless sometimes. Um, yeah, you, if you're really honest, sometimes you feel incompetent. I tried everything and nothing's worked, right? Maybe I'm not really cut out for this. So this student will drive you to those places inside yourself, this, this really intense and uncomfortable emotion. My guess is that as I describe the student, he probably reminds you a little bit of the young man or the young woman that I ask you to think about. And I get it, man, this kid's a lot. I, I work with kids like this all the time, all the time. Um, so I get it. Um, so this kid uh, is not in sixth grade anymore. Of all things, this little stinker grew up and became a licensed psychologist, and that's what he looks like today. Yeah, I was that kid, and, and what I want to do to, to encourage you um, in the time I have left, I just want to share my story with you. Um, and again, I think that'll do more to encourage you than me talking through data and research. Um, the setting is the early 1980s, location, lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas, very southern tip of Texas, about 30 miles from the border of Mexico, mostly Latino, mostly Spanish-speaking. There are um, 3,143 approximately counties in the United States. This was the fifth poorest per capita. So that's the setting. I'm walking up to school, first day of school, sixth grade. I see this teacher standing at the front door with his arms crossed, and he had a, he had a big paddle in his back pocket. And his last name started with T. Um, and we called him Mr. T, because he was like Mr. T from the A-team, right? I pity the fool, right? The fact that he was Caucasian made it even richer, I think, for us to call him Mr. T. <laughs> I'd never had Mr. T, but two things we knew about him. Number one, you didn't make the rules with Mr. T. Um, no matter who you were, if you broke the rules with Mr. T, you were going to get a consequence. Second thing we knew about Mr. T was he didn't care about us. What he cared about was compliance. That's what he cared about. He didn't care about us, though. Again, I never had the guy, but I didn't like him. And so I see him, and he sees me. We make eye contact, and I'm thinking, you know what? I don't want to do this with you. I don't want to engage you, not on day one. So I start going around to the back of the school to come in the back way. Well, he follows me. Follows me, gets right up into my space, and he holds out his hand. He said, stop right there, young man. He said, listen, I, want, I know who you are. I know who you are. Your name is Lou Signs. 
I talked to your teachers from last year. I know you gave them a run for the money. I know that your older brother's about to drop out of high school. I know you run in the streets. I know you're using drugs. I know you got problems with the law. Um, I know that your mom's not, she doesn't care about you. I know your dad, he's out of the picture. I know everything about you. So don't even come onto my campus, into my classroom, and act like you're all that. I already know who you are, right? So the game's up. And he said, but I want you to understand one thing, young man. From the moment you step foot onto my campus, in my classroom, I'm not going to put up with it this year from you. Your other teachers may have, but I'm not. I'm going to get you in line. I will have you in line this year, period, period. Um, and then he said, in fact, young man, if you so much as even speak a word of Spanish, in my classroom, me and you and this big brown paddle that I have right here, we're going to march down to the office and we're going to take care of business. And then he leaned over and he pointed his finger in my face. And he said, do you understand me, young man? And I knew right away he meant business because he was Mr. T. So I leaned right back into his face and I said, Si entiendo, pendejo. <laughs> We've got Spanish speakers up here in Indiana. That's awesome. I never know who's going to get that. Uh, for those of you who didn't understand it, I will translate. It means yes, I understand perfectly. <laughs> you might want to Google that before you roll that into your conversational Spanish. <laughs> Fair warning. No, but if Amanos, man, it was a short honeymoon, right? He said if I spoke Spanish, uh, you know, there'd be consequences. They were his rules, and I broke them. So off we went to the office. Day one, right? Short honeymoon. Bam, bam, bam. Well, you know what happened? We got locked into a pattern. Every day, that's all we did. To the office, from the office. To, that was it, man. If I'd had an IEP, goal one would have been Lou will go to the office, right? I mean, that's all I did. You know, and Mr. T always had these one-liners for me as we're walking down to the office. Well, Lou, you couldn't make it through a single day, could you, Lou? Well, Lou, it must be your job to make my job hell, right? And, and it wasn't just at, at, at school, it was at home too. You know, my mom was a, she was a single parent mom and trying to do the right thing, but just out of her league, like just, just not even remotely equipped to do that. And every day I got home, I would hear it from my mom, you know, ay, mijito, what have you done? Ay, mijito, when will you learn? Ay, mijito, pues quien te manda? You know, why do you do these things, right? It was a beat down. Three things happened that year that made my life particularly difficult. Uh, first thing, it's a long story, but um, two of my friends went to go buy some drugs. There was a shootout, and my friends were murdered. Very next day, there I was back on my campus, you know, to the office, from the office. Couldn't make it through a single day, could you, Lou? Second thing that happened uh, that was related to that first thing is that um, a group of young men broke into my home. They restrained me, and they sexually assaulted my cousin. And for a number of reasons, I couldn't talk about it. Um, but the next day, there I was back on my campus, you know, to the office, from the office, must be your job to make my job hell, Lou, right? The third thing that happened is that I was arrested for possession. And man, I, I will never forget the, the look on my mom's face when she came to get me that time, the, the anger in her face. I knew she was done. I knew she was done. And she voluntarily re relinquished parental rights. And um, I went to live with uh, a family several hundred miles away. I was down in the tip of Texas. I, 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 it, several hundred miles away, I moved to what was then this tiny rice farming town outside of Houston, out in the sticks called Katy, Texas, right? Uh, and uh, it, it's huge now, but back then it was one elementary, one middle school, one high school. I'd never seen so many pickup trucks in my life, you know? So I rolled into Katy and I said, you know what? I don't fit in here. I grew up in a place that was mostly Latino. We all spoke Spanish. Nobody speaks Spanish. I'm the token brown boy. Nobody dresses like me. Nobody listens to my music, but I'm good because all I know is none of these teachers know any of those teachers back home. None of these kids know any of those kids back home. And Man, I couldn't score a joint in Katy, Texas to save my life. And Lord knows I tried, man. There was just no dope in the rice paddy, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that was that. I did pretty well at Katy Junior High and Katy High School. Um, but then my senior year, my depression kicked back in because the family that I live with, they said, listen, uh, we, we care about you, but you need to understand when you're 18, when you graduate, you're on your own. It's up to you now. And I was terrified, you know, because I, th I, I just knew like, no, 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 no. Like when you take all the structure away from me, I'm done. I'm done, you know? Uh, back then, I mean, it, you know, this was in the 80s. It wasn't like you, you went to somebody when you were a kid and said, huh, I, I feel sad. I'm crying all the time. You know, I don't like being around people. I don't, don't want to do things. I don't want to take a shower, you know? Oh, really? It sounds like you're depressed. Let's get you evaluated. We can get you treatment. I mean, none of that happened back then, right? My thinking back then was, well, you just forget the past and you move on. And it, it just doesn't work that way. Well, sure enough, I graduated from Katy High School, and that's when the bottom fell out. I ended up in San Antonio. I was working as a dishwasher. I was sleeping on a floor in a shack behind a house, and I didn't own much. I had um, a sleeping bag, a pillow, I had a, a suitcase with some clothes, and I had a box of journals. 
And that box of journals was my prized possession because I had learned all the way back in sixth grade that between the covers of a journal was my only safe place in the world. That was the only place I could express what I was thinking and feeling without fear. So I had learned to use journaling as a therapy tool. And I remember coming home from work one morning about 3 a.m. I'd closed the restaurant and I was just incredibly depressed. It was the, the darkest time in my life. So I came home at 3 a.m. and I thought, I'm overwhelmed. I need to write. I need to get some thoughts out, right? So I laid out my sleeping bag. And then as I reached into my journal box, I saw these two pieces of paper. I didn't recognize what they were. And, and so I kind of dug in there and pulled them out. And I was blown away at what I found. They, they were letters that had been written to me by two of my teachers my senior year at Katy High School. Um, I'd completely forgotten about this, but one was written to me by Joella Exley who was my English teacher, and one was written to me by Polly McRoberts, who was my creative writing teacher. And so I pulled the letters out. This is part of what one of those letters said. You're extremely talented and intelligent, but most importantly, you have a good heart. I know you will use your talents to help your fellow man, and that's the most satisfying life a person can have. It said some other things, but that's really what jumped out, and it was signed by Joella Exley, who was my English teacher. So I folded that letter, put it away, pulled out the second letter. This is part of what it said. Don't quit writing, especially in your journal. Someday, it may be the basis for your book. You have insight, sensitivity, intelligence, maturity beyond your tender years, keeping you your special person. And it was signed by Polly McRoberts, my creative writing teacher. It said some other things, but that's really what jumped out. And those words just destroyed me, you know? Because I thought, hold on, I know who I am. I'm, I'm Lou Sines. I'm, I'm a 19-year-old version of that sixth grade kid that's never going to make it through a single day, whose job it is to make your life hell, who's never going to learn, Right? Um, I'm working as a dishwasher. I'm sleeping on a floor. Um, I've got no hope. I've got no future. I've got no family. I've got no education. I've got no money. I've got, well, I wouldn't say I've got nothing because here's what I do have. I have panic attacks. I have uh, thoughts that won't go away. Um, I have uh, a pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression. I have crying spells that I can't control, right? Um, and um, I wasn't suicidal at that point, but I remember thinking like, are you kidding me? I'm 19 years old and I've got another 60 years of this life to put up with, what's the point, right? And the one thing I do have is a big fat bag of dope that might help me get through the day. That's what I have, right? I know who I am, but here were these two women for whom I had tremendous respect that were disagreeing with me. And because of just who they were and the way they lived their life in front of us, not, not as teachers, as human beings, I couldn't blow them off because I knew they wouldn't have written those words if they didn't absolutely believe it, right? So back and forth I went, who's right about me? I think I know who I am, but here are these two women that are saying something different, you know, and, and it tortured me for a solid three months. Finally, I said, I can't take it anymore. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create a test that I know I'm gonna fail, but once I fail this test, that's all the proof I need in my own heart to look at those women and say, you know what, that was really sweet, but you were wrong. I had you fooled, I was right. Here's the test. I'm gonna to try to get into college. I have no idea how you do that. Neither of my parents went to college. I don't have any money, I'm not college material. But once I fail at that task, that's all the proof I need to look at them and say, you know what, let me go live my miserable life. Got on a bus, took a bus to UTSA, University of Texas at San Antonio. My very first experience on a college campus was a panic attack. Stepped off the bus, as soon as the doors closed and the brakes hissed and that bus pulled away, my thoughts started racing. You don't belong here, you're not college material, you don't have money, you're not smart enough, you're never gonna get in, right? Uh, brown kids don't get degrees, who do you know that has a degree? You get, get back on that bus, you know, just thoughts were racing, my heart was pounding, you know, and I just went up to the first kid I saw with the backpack and I said, are you a student? And he said, yep. I said, man, how do you get in? How did you do this? And he said, well, you need to go to that building over there and talk to these people. Um, long story short, met some amazing people that case managed me through every step of the way. And so, you know, I submitted my application and said, whatever, I'm done, right? Several months later, I'm just there at the restaurant, you know, just cleaning dishes back in the steamy area. And the manager comes back and he says, hey, man, you got a letter from UTSA. And I said, what's UTSA? <laughs> And he said, the university? And I said, oh, that. And so I'm thinking like, okay, great. Well, this is the flush letter. This is where you know, I get my data, right? Open it up. And instead of, we sincerely regret to inform you, it said, congratulations, you've been admitted, right? And I, I was kind of like, nah, I don't know, man. This, it may be, right? So I said, all right, well, I'll go up there and see what they say. Um, the, the question isn't, can I get into college? The question is, can I do college? And I can't. It's really a moot point. I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail out. So the first course I had to take was a remedial, like English 101 kind of thing, just one course. And I took it, and at the end of the semester, I not only did I pass it, I made an A. 
And um, that was the first time in my life I, I gave myself permission not to believe Miss McRoberts and Miss Exley, but just to consider maybe, maybe they were right and maybe you were wrong. Maybe, right? On the one hand, on the other hand, this could have been a clerical error for all you know. You should probably take another course, right? So I took another one that spring and I passed it. And, and every semester, like, okay, I'll sign up for these two, but this is gonna be the one that's gonna do me in. This is where they, I finally get exposed as an imposter and they, they boot me out, right? And then the next thing you know, I'm taking Shakespeare and Chaucer. Just before I turned 27 years old, I graduated with my undergraduate degree in English. Never, 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 never thought I was going to get a college degree, never thought I was college material, never, never. And finally, now that I was in my, my mid to late 20s, I said, that's it. I'm done being Lou. I'm done being that kid whose job it is to make your life hell, who's never going to learn, who can't make it through a single day. And, and I said, they were right about me. Ms. McRoberts and Ms. Axley could see something in me that I couldn't see in myself so many years ago. And then psychologically, just as a way to give myself permission to be somebody else, I said, I'm going to start going by my first name now. My name is Adam Lewis Signs, and I've always been Lou. I'm going to be Adam from now on. Maybe Adam can live into this different life. So I finished my degree. I finally got a job coordinating mental health services for kids in foster care for a private foster placement agency. Finally had money and benefits, finally got medication, finally got therapy, finally got treatment. Started my master's in counseling. Um, and then by the time I finished my master's, I, I'd realized they were right, you were wrong, Adam. Found a lot of healing through my treatment and therapy. Um, then I said, I love school, I wanna keep going. Um, I applied to, to Texas A&M to a PhD in school psychology, it was accepted, did four years of coursework there. And the very last thing we have to do as, as psychology doctoral students is a year of clinical training. It's called your pre-doc internship. Um, I applied to Harvard Medical School. I was accepted, did my major rotations at Boston Children's. And the whole thing came full circle in March of 2001. Uh, I remember I was sitting in Logan Airport um, in March. It was snowing outside. I was waiting for my flight. I was going to fly back to College Station to defend my dissertation. I was going to graduate in May. And I had applied to postdocs at Brown, Yale, and Columbia. And Brown was my top choice because of the clinical work. So I'm sitting waiting for my flight, and my cell phone rang. And I didn't recognize the area code. So I answered, I said, hello, this is Adam. A voice on the other end said, Adam, hey, uh, this is Dr. Jay Reeve at Brown Medical School. Listen, we got your paperwork, we really enjoyed our interview with you, and I'm calling to offer you a faculty appointment here at Brown. We'd love for you to come join us and finish your postdoc. All right, and I was thrilled, right? This is my top choice, and I'm sort of like doing the happy dance and all that, and he's telling me about the research and the clinical work. Well, as he's talking about what, what the position entails, I had an incoming phone call, and I didn't recognize the area code. And I said, Dr. Reeve, I'm so sorry to ask, but do you mind if I put you on hold? I've got a call coming in. I think I need to get it. And he said, sure, no problem. So I clicked over and I said, hello, this is Adam. And then a voice on the other end said, Adam, hey, uh, this is Dr. Chuck Sanislow at Yale Medical School. Listen, we got your paperwork. We really enjoyed our interview with you. And I'm calling to offer you a faculty appointment here at Yale to finish your postdoc. I said, dude, I got Brown on the other line. Let me call you back. Click. <laughs> Switched over, took the position at Brown, and then hung up, you know, and that's when it hit me, like jaw, like almost literally on the floor, mouth agape. Did I just hang up on Yale because I had Brown on the other line, you know? And, and that's when I realized, Adam, you can write your own ticket. You know, you're qualified to do what you love to do, which is practice psychology at any hospital, any university, any school district in the country. And you're bilingual, for crying out loud. So you just decide where you want to go, and I bet you they'll make a place for you, right? And, and I think for anyone to have a moment where you realize that your, um, your professional skill set is that valued, it's a landmark moment. But when you grow up doing without and not having things and you have that moment, it's just surreal. And I realized in that moment, I wouldn't have these options now if I didn't have a PhD. And I never would have had the courage to apply for a PhD if I hadn't finished my, my master's. Never could have applied for a master's if I hadn't finished my undergrad uh, in English. And man, I'm here to tell you. I know that I know that I know that I know. I never would have stepped out to be anything more than that mistaken version of who I thought I was uh, had men and women like you not spoken truth into my life 35 years ago. Two women could have said, they don't pay me enough to put up with a kid like that. Hey, I didn't bring that kid into this planet. Don't make me parent him. And man, they would have been exactly right. But by God's grace, man, they knew. Uh, uh, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? Um, and I'm deeply, deeply indebted uh, to Ms. McRoberts and Ms. Exley. And I always say, you know, I I'm grateful for the doors that my education has opened and the opportunities it has afforded me. But education really didn't change my life. Educators did. It was men and women like you who took the time to get to know that kid, 
what's behind everything that you see, what's going on inside, and how can we intervene. If you ever happen to be in Katy, Texas for any reason, and you're driving down um, uh, um, Westheimer Park where you're gonna see this building, and that's Joella Exley Elementary. And if you ever happen to be driving down France Road, you're gonna see that building, and that's Polly McRoberts Elementary. And I'm so proud of Katie for honoring those two women. Give me five more minutes, I'm gonna tell you about the second, second uh, student, and we'll take a break. This was Maya Chavez. And when I look at that picture of Maya, her smile does not convince me. <coughs> Excuse me, and when I think about who she was when that picture was taken, I think, man, what does this kid have to smile about? She was in fourth grade. She had been in the custody of protective services for two years already in her young life. She had experienced things that no human being should ever have to experience, let alone a little girl. And we sit her down in front of a camera and tell her to say cheese. I mean, what's her to smile about, right? Um, well, what you know, um, because of what you do for a living, is that for kids that grow up in, in chaos, uh, they develop a base layer of emotion. Uh, they live in fight or flight. They're always uh, in, in uh, arousal mode because they never know what to expect. And I'm not talking about from year to year or month. I'm talking about from moment to this moment, now to this moment, now to this moment, is this gonna be when somebody walks into my room and touches me? Is this gonna be when the bullets come flying through the window? Is this gonna be the moment where somebody knocks on my door and says, ma'am, we're here to take your kids away, right? Moment to moment to moment. And you're 10 years old for crying out loud. I mean, how do you begin to understand that? And, and so these kids live in fight or flight and they, they figure out real quick that flight is never the right answer. You always fight, you never run, right? So then there's aggression, conduct problems, um, and, and it's, it's, it's horrible, right? So then what happens if the parents aren't doing what they need to be doing to keep the children safe, protective services will remove them and put them in foster care. And we in our adult minds think, well good, at least they're in a safe place now, sorta. Of. But what that kid is thinking is, you know what, that family may have been crazy, but they were my crazy and I don't have them anymore. So then you add to that first layer of emotion, the, the fear slash anxiety slash stress, a second layer of emotion, and that's sadness and grieving because they're grieving the loss of their biological families. And then what happens is those kids know that building called school and the adults in that building are the safest, most predictable part of their world. And if they're gonna act out those feelings of anxiety, fear, frustration, sadness, grieving, and loss, they know. That building and those adults are the safest place to do it. It makes our calling extremely difficult at times, but in many ways it's a badge of honor because those kids are saying, you're safe and I can get this out with you. Well, what happens, statistically speaking, across the country, if a child has not been adopted by the time they're 10, 11, 12 years old, the likelihood that they will ever be adopted, it drops dramatically, right? Um, and so then you add a third layer of emotion to those kids' palate and it's hopelessness because they know in their gut I'm not adopted, I'm 10, 11, 12 years old, the ship sailed and I wasn't on it, right? And by now, uh, they're acting out not just where it's safe in schools, they're acting out on the streets where it's not safe. So you have a history of interaction with the legal system, probation officers, ankle monitors. Um, it, it's, it's just, it, it's so complicated at that point. And if you ever have a family that's even thinking about adopting a child like this, that state worker will sit down that family at a table and, and have them read through stacks and stacks of paperwork loads of referrals, loads of, of psychological evaluation, a list of diagnoses, a list of medications, inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, all of that, because the state is saying, this will not be a bait and switch. If you're gonna, if you're gonna adopt this child with special needs, you, know, you need to know what you're signing up for, right? And who's gonna wanna sign up for that, for crying out loud? Well, Maya ended up in Judge Cindy Miller's court in Bryan, Texas. Uh, she stood in front of Judge Miller in March of 2010. Judge Miller slammed her gavel and changed Maya's life forever. Um, but for Maya, the circumstances were a little bit different because a family read her file and they said, we know exactly what we're signing up for. And in March of 2010, Judge Miller made it official. And that was the day that Maya Chavez became Maya Signs when my wife and I and our children adopted her. So there we are on our adoption day with the judge. Uh, that was on a Tuesday, right? Uh, that very next Saturday, Maya and I had our very first daddy-daughter dance. And there we are getting ready for the daddy-daughter dance. And she was so cute. I said, all right, sweet girl, uh, you've got a new dress, you've got new shoes, you are beautiful. And I said, you know what, before we get to the dance, before we go to the dance, I just I'm gonna take you out to eat dinner, anywhere that you wanna go. And man, her little eyes, lit. I said, are you kidding me, anywhere I wanna go? I said, anywhere you wanna go, you name it. Steak, lobster, seafood, I don't care. Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Chick-fil-A. So we had a chicken sandwich and waffle fries in our formal wear. It was the bomb. 
So after dinner, we went to the dance. And I remember all day just thinking like, you know, she'd only been with us for about six months at this point. And I just remember thinking like, I want to make one point of connecting with her at the dance tonight, you know, just so we can really kind of go to the next level in terms of understanding each other. So we had dinner, we had Chick-fil-A, and then we went to the dance and got there into the gym and we got our, our punch and we settled in to our table and there was a, a few moments of kind of awkward silence. And then I remember I reached over and I held her hand and I took that picture. And I said, sweet girl, um, let's talk. I, I said, there are two things we need to talk about. Number one, um, you have a job and number two, I have a job. So let's talk about your job. Your job is to follow the rules, sweetheart. And I said, there's not a comma at the end of that statement. There's not a, qu there's a period. You don't make the rules in the family mom and I do, and your job is to follow them. Um, and I said, you, you're 10 years old. You haven't earned any of my trust. My hope is that by the time you're 18, you've earned enough of my trust that you're making your own rules, right? Because you'll be an adult at that point. But for right now, you're 10, uh, and you don't make the rules. Mom and I do, and your job is to follow them. Do you understand that? And she said, oh, yes, sir, I do. And I said, great. Um, and so, so that's the first thing. Here's the second thing we, we need to talk about. I have a job. Let's talk about my job. Do you know what my job is? And she said, oh, yes, sir, your job is to make sure that I follow the rules. And I smiled and I said, oh, no, 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 sweetheart. I said, I want you to look at my eyes when I tell you this because this is one of the most important things I will ever, ever say to you. And I said, sweet girl, my job is to lay my life down for you. My, my job is to love you, to protect you, to provide for you, to comfort you, to nurture you, to encourage you to be there for you. And I said, sweet girl, there, there is no thing on this planet more valuable than you, not even in the same category. And my job is to lay my life down for you so that you will understand your value because once you understand your value, you will live as though your choices matter. You will understand that, that you were not a mistake. You will understand that just like me, you have a calling, you have a purpose, you have, you're here for a reason on this planet. You have good to do with your life. And I said, sweet girl, listen, I get something. You're, you're going to push us and you're going to test us. Do they really, really mean it when they say they make the rules and I don't? And you're going to push us and test us. Do they really, really mean it when they say they love me? And I said, sweetheart, I'm not going to like that. It's going to make me angry. It's going to frustrate me. But I want you to understand one thing right now. There is nothing, nothing you could ever, ever do that will ever separate you from my love for you. I will always be your father, and you will always be my girl. I'm not going anywhere, and nothing can change that. I said, my trust, I don't give it away. You have to earn it. But my love is a gift, and all you have to do is receive it. And then I remember in a moment of incredible insight, she looked at me, and she said, Dad, I don't think I've ever been loved that way before. And I smiled, and I said, oh, sweet girl, believe it or not, I know exactly how you feel. I said, let me tell you a story about a kid I used to know. His name was Lou. And I shared my story with her, you know, just as I've shared it with you. And as I shared my story with her, this peace came over her. Because I think she realized this guy might work out. This might be a safe place for me. And it was a powerful, powerful moment in my relationship with my daughter. And the reason I share her as a case study is just to underscore the generational power that we have. You know, when I think about the men and women that invested in me and, and, and poured into me, when quite frankly, I was not the best version of myself. How do I look at a girl like this and not bring her into my life and into my heart? Um, it's, it's, that's the generational power that we have. The, the little ones that are, gonna, that are showing up on our, our campuses and running our hallways, 20, 30, 40 years from now when some of us are barely able to, to rock a rocker, it's going to be their world. They're going to own the businesses. They're going to own the vehicles. They're going to own the homes. They're going to own all of this. They're going to run it. And when they sit down over a beer, over a coffee, whatever, and talk about who their game changers were, your names are gonna come up. You're gonna be the people that they cite as the deciding factor in their lives. That is the power that you have, um, and, and it is amazing. My wife and I were married in 1995. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary uh, this year, in fact. Um, this is what my kids look like in 2002. There's my daughter, Alisa, on the left. There's Isaiah in the middle, and there's Andrew on the right. This is what they look like in 2008. There's Isaiah on the left. Alisa in the middle and Andrew on the right. And this is what my kids look like in 2010. There's Alisa on top, Isaiah on top, Andrew on the bottom, and there's Maya. This was 2015. We're actually on the campus at, at A&M there, um, and they were all uh, teenagers there. And this was Thanksgiving. 
And we are um, so blessed uh, as a family. So here's what I want to do to close. I, I want you to close your eyes. Let, let me end with this. Close your eyes and think about the kid that's wearing you out. I get that. Uh, I don't blame you. I don't judge you for that. Um, that student is a lot. Um, but close your eyes and let me just speak to you on behalf of that child. Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Thank you for coming to work today. I don't know where I'll end up when I'm 19. I may be earning academic honors at an Ivy League university. I may be serving my country in the military. I may be an employed high school graduate. I may be in jail. I may not even make it to 19. Only God knows. <clears throat> but regardless of where I might be and what I might be doing at 19, you need to know that our interaction, you, the educator, and me, the student, it shapes me. You need to know that even though the school building may sometimes seem like a zoo to you in some very important ways, the school building can be the safest place on the planet for me. You need to know that when you teach me, even at your worst, you have the potential to be a better influence on me than much of what and who I experience off this campus. You need to know that when you love me, even at your worst, you have the potential to love me more sincerely and effectively than many people I'm around away from this campus. The state will give me a test once a year that may measure some of what you've taught me, but I guarantee you, Life will give me a test every day that measures all of what you've taught me. So thank you for teaching me, especially in those moments when every part of my being is communicating I don't want to be taught by you. Thank you for loving me, especially in those moments when every part of my being is communicating I don't want to be loved by you. Bottom line, I need you. I need to know you care about me. I need to know that I don't make the rules. And I may never be fortunate enough to appreciate that and express that or even realize that, but I hope you're courageous enough never to forget. So thank you for coming to work today, sir. Thank you for coming to work today, ma'am. Please take care of yourself. Please be well. Please come back tomorrow. You went into education to make a difference, and uh, man, I'm here to tell you, you were not wrong. My life is living proof. The, the kids that we're working with now, um, I was them 35, 40 years ago. What you're doing matters, and um, we may not get to see the fruits of our labor immediately, but I guarantee you the work is not in vain. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Uh, have a great, great rest of the morning. God bless you.